Ah. Pronto. Hey. Uh, I think Please uh, come to the stage. Exactly, Shay. Yeah. I, I believe it's better if all authors stay on the stage. It's going to be simpler for them and for you doing questions. Great. Thanks a lot. And the fourth person. Two and one here. You want, <laughs> am I correct? I, I hope I'm correctly pronouncing his name. Is is Huan Wang here? Yeah, uh, Please come to the stage. Oh, yeah, you. Are all presenters here? No, one is missing, I think. Lua is definitely the first or first presenter, and the second is one here. And I can see the third center here. Oh yes, please come onto the stage. Best I'm here, probably. Yeah, sure. I, I think we can begin. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, the session. I'm going to turn off the lights. To remember everyone, uh, you have some screen uh, buttons in the top of your screen. So I send this message to the chat. But in the center of your top screen, you have this screen zoom. Select the, the screen to, to see. So use them, OK? So yeah, I'm going to turn off lights so you can begin the session, OK? OK. Next so hello, hello everyone, and welcome to the first paper session of ISMA 2020. I'm Shohei Mori from uh, from Graz University of Technology. So today we have four presentations in this session. Uh, each 10 minutes presentation is followed by five minutes uh, QA session. Please post your questions in Hoover app, and I will try to pick any questions as possible. So let's move on to the first presentation. Please go ahead. Welcome to the iLearn Virtual Campus. Please sign up for a free iLearn membership on our website, check out our seventh annual conference coming next spring 2021, and let us know if you're interested in hosting events or leasing space on our campus by emailing campus at immersivelrn.org. Hello, and welcome to your presentation about case dependent simulation of light perception in virtual reality. My name is Laura Rudolph, I'm from TU Wien, and I was working with Michael Wimmer and Katharina Krösl. The display of a range of low dynamic range monitors is significantly less than the human perceivable range. The brightness of an image needs to be compressed to properly display high dynamic range images on LDR monitors. This compression is commonly done using tone mappers. However, these algorithms are focused on 2D displays where the perception is inherently different than natural human vision. Glare or stotopic vision 
and other specific light effects are not treated in the eye on common monitors. For convincingly realistic VR scenes, immersion is a significant factor. Therefore, we need to simulate what can't be seen on LDR displays. Algorithms approximating the human perception are necessary for realistic simulations. A medical basis can help to understand and simulate such vision effects. The gaze direction and the pupil size play an important role in these effects as well. Finally, such algorithms workflow that allows accurate simulation of human light perception in virtual reality and augmented reality. Our medically based perception effects are able to run in real time following an optometrist's advice. We include eye tracking to measure the light incidence into the human eye and our algorithms account for the user's gaze point. For evaluation, we conducted a pilot user study that compared a real-world low-light scene to our simulation in VR. The following four methods are included in our application. First, we adjust the brightness of the scene over time to simulate the adaptation of rods and cones. Rods and cones are the photoreceptors in our eyes which process the incoming light. Here on the left side, you can see the non-adapted original scene and on the right side, the fully adapted scene after approximately three seconds. Secondly, we simulate the glaring effect we perceive when looking at bright light sources. This phenomenon is caused by the scattering of light inside the human eye. Here we see a comparison of a standard bloom to our perceptual glare. Additionally, the loss of visual acuity in low light scenes is included in our application. In darker environments, we are not able to make out many details due to the rods not being present in the phobia. This is a rather subtle effect, but on this close-up, you can see the difference between the visual acuity reduction effect turned off and on. Last, we add a bluish color shift as naturally perceived in low light scenes. This effect appears due to the rods being more sensitive to longer wavelengths of light than the cones during daylight. Here we see the difference between the scene's original colors and the shift's colors. In the following, I will talk about the details about those four effects. For the temporal eye adaptation, we first calculate a target luminance for every frame, which is weighted by the gaze direction. Then we use an exponential function that takes the target luminance, last frame's luminance, as well as the adaptation times of rods and cones into account. This gives us a temporally filtered luminance value for our current frame, which is then multiplied with the linear RGB values of the frame. For the glare, we will first have a look at why this phenomenon actually occurs. On the slides, you can see the side view of a human eye. In our simulation, we simplified the lens at the front of the eye as a 2D plane that basically looks like this. The white region signifies that light is able to pass through, this means it is the aperture of the eye. The size of this 2D pupil is adapted according to the measured real-time value from our eye tracker. Now, a single wavelength light ray passes through the lens and hits the retina at the fovea, which is the center. Now, imagine another 2D plane that is located at the back of our eyes, which represents the retina. Our green light ray hitting the retina plane would look something like this. However, it's not that simple. The human eye, specifically the corner and the lens, contain small irregularities or particles that scatter the incoming light. These particles are here displayed as dots. There are many thousands located in the lens and they are the main influence in creating the glare. When our light ray hits one of those particles, it scatters and we receive a pattern at the retina like this. Due to the wave characteristic of light, we can calculate the scattering of rays on the particles as the diffraction of waves on an obstacle. After Rich et al. we apply the Huygen Fresnel principle to calculate the diffraction pattern. We use a pre calculated random dot pattern as well as the real time pupil size from our eye tracker. The amount of particles can be individually adjusted. We used 1000 particles in our simulation. Shown diffraction pattern is a so-called monochromatic point spread function. 
It describes the way the scattering of a single wavelength light appears. However, usually lights consist of multiple rays of different wavelengths, which is why we need to combine multiple scaled copies of this monochromatic PSF over the full human perceivable spectrum. The, this combination gives us our glare curve, the spectral PSF, when assuming equal energy light. Finally, we need to apply our kernel to our simulated image. This is done by a convolution of the image and the kernel. However, transforming both VR views for the right and the left eye to frequency space for every frame is very costly and not feasible in VR. Therefore, we only apply the kernel to a 1024 x 1024 window centered on the gaze points. Afterwards, we blend the convolved window with the original image. This results in a more accurate simulation of glare influence on the human eye due to the lower influence at the periphery. Additionally, we achieve a significant speed up. For the visual acuity reduction, we transformed our image to the LAB color space because it is perceptually linear. We blow only the lightness value L with the Gaussian filter. The kernel of this filter uses a sigma depending on the current lightness of every pixel. We introduce a new simpler formula for this. It is based on medical data that describes the maximum perceivable visual acuity at the lightness L. Therefore, our approach blurs dark areas strong than areas that are in the light. After the tone mapping, we apply a lavender color shift according to the sensitivity of the rods. This is done depending on the brightness of every individual pixel. So we simulate the bluish purple tint that we perceive in low light scenes, especially during scotopic vision. For evaluation, we conducted a user study with five participants with normal or corrected to normal vision. The participants were asked to compare the real-world perception to our simulation and grade it on a Likert scale from 1 to 7. The white bars show the average ratings and the smaller black bars signify the 25 and 75 percentile. Generally, our application was well received, where only the appearance of the glare was rated less than 5. Overall, we conclude that visual perception is different for every person. And to create a universal perceptual realistic experience, we need individual adaptation for the user. To conclude, we presented a real-time VR and AR post-processing workflow that can be added to any renderer. We use eye tracking to generate more realistic simulations while our implementations are based on medical research. Finally, we held a pilot use study which showed that our four implemented effects were well received namely the temporal eye adaptation, epiceptual glare, visual acuity reduction, and scotopic color vision. Our glare implementation is already in use in a cataract simulation. If you're interested into the details, refer to the paper Cataract Simulating Cataracts in Augmented Reality, which is also present, presented at ISMA this year. For future work, further medical specifications could be included, such as lens deformations or a more detailed glare count. Additional effects such as after images or noise and scotopic vision also impact our visual perception and are not accounted for yet in our application. Additionally, further user studies using an HDR display for comparison or evaluating our implementation in AR should be held. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your virtual attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the live Q&A. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. We will move on to the uh, QA. So, but I think I don't see any questions so far in Hoover. Uh, in case you can't find the Hoover QA tab, uh, you could just open your Hoover and navigate to agenda and find the session name. And in there, you can have uh, each session. So, by clicking or tapping that, you can find the QA. I hope. So maybe I can start. So can you hear me, Dula? Yes. Okay. So I think I I actually have some video experiences having uh, handling IA tracking because uh, they are always difficult to calibrate on each user properly. 
as you yes. probably experienced. So was yeah. this perhaps the reason why you had only five participants in your user study? Um, because of the eye tracking. No, actually not. We were in our user study, we were only targeting to have a um, pilot user study that helps us evaluate future work. So we actually intentionally only took very few users to participate so we could get uh, qualitative feedback by uh, making detailed um, conversations and talking about the, all of the effects in very detail so uh, we can improve it in further work. So maybe I can have some more questions. Probably. Okay, so uh, please don't hesitate to post your questions on Hoover. <laughs> then, so I will have the second question. So I think it's always difficult to know what users exactly see in their eyes. So, and so it's important to have user studies as you did rather than comparing ideal images and with uh, rendered images, I think. And, but I'd like to know how your user study was conducted actually. So first, for example, uh, how did participants compare with your rendering and the real images? Were the images displayed on an identical uh, flat screen, or you know, did they see mm -hmm. it from the virtual headset, or uh, or okay. did the participants need to take off in that case the headset to see the flat screen, or you know, for every video stimuli? Um, well, first of all, we actually compared um, our simulation to a real world scene, so we didn't compare it to. A, another scene that was on a um, screen or whatever, it was really compared to the real world. We set up a similar scene to what we had in the video of this office scene in our lab. And we asked the participants to um, tell us as we, we, we um, they were in the, in the lab and we asked them a few questions about their own uh, perception. So basically, what does the uh, look, light look like for you? How does it change? Whether you're looking to the right or to the left? And after this, this was about 10 minutes. After this, they put on their VR headsets. And we again asked them the same questions to compare it to the real world perception. Oh, I see. Thank you. Oh, I think I have one question from the audience in Hoover. So. Uh, it looks like your methodology for creating perceptual glare would all allow you to easily simulate astigmatism uh, sorry, <laughs> for typical, typically sighted people by having a non-circular lens. Have you considered using your approach for a typical, a typical sight simulation, uh, simulation for normally uh, sighted people by Alex G. Moore? Um, yes, actually, um, to be fair, I don't really know how astigmatism works, so no, we haven't done that. But uh, as I already mentioned in my talk, uh, my colleague Katharina Grösel um, is using this work for the glare uh, for um, simulating cataracts in VR. So you should check out her. You should check out her presentation and. Uh, there you find more details about it. And so astigmatism, no other simulations, yes. So we are short in time, so let's move on to the next uh, presentation. Oh, thank you, Lua, for your nice Thank you very much. So the next presentation will be about foveated instant radio CT presented by Lili Wong. So then volunteer, please. Uh, play the video. Hello, everyone. I'm Ren Zeli from Beihang University, Beijing, China. Our paper is for weighted instant radiosity. This work is together with Lili Wang, Xu Hai Xu, and Zhi Chao Li from Beihang University, and with Ling Qi Yan from the University of California, Santa Barbara. For weighted rendering is an efficient rendering technique. That provide users different rendering quality in foveal region and the peripheral region according to the model of human visual system. The traditional rationalization method can be adapted to foveal rendering directly. 
because it can render scenes with multi spatial resolutions easily. But resolution cannot easily render indirect illumination. Ray tracing method can also be integrated into the foreated rendering framework easily, but are limited by performance. Instant results they provide a solution for running global illumination for the dynamic scenes with diffuse surveys interactively. However, VPLs are independent of the user's viewpoint. So VPLs in the standard resolution method cannot be arranged according to the Fourier region directly. To adapt the standard resolution to Fourier rendering, we use multi-resolution illumination as a high-level idea, which means that the numbers of VPL contributing to the different regions of the output image are different. To achieve this goal, two challenges need to be addressed. One is how to generate VPLs for each frame based on the Fourier. The other is how to maintain the adjacent frame stability with the Fourier region, the viewpoint, all the same change. We designed a Fourier running framework for instant reality to do multi-resolution illumination for different regions by controlling the number of VPL cast on them. There are five main steps. First, to generate VPLs efficiently, we voxelize the scenes. Inspired by sequential multicolor in standard reality, we only use the rays emitted from the viewpoint and the bounce ones to generate the VPL candidate. We sample the formula region uniformly to get a 2D sample point in the image plan. The rays are emitted from the viewpoint to this sample point and are reflected in random directions to intersect with the voxelized scene. The intersections are used to place VPL candidate. We propose a VPL for the importance that indicates the VPL's lighting contribution to the foveal region of the output image. The foveated importance of VPL can be computed in two steps. Voxel foveated weight estimation and VPL foveated importance calculation. First, we estimate a foveated weight for each visible voxel in the for in the voxel light scene from the current viewpoint. In our implementation, a foveated weight map is generated on the image plan. And each visible voxel is projected onto this map to get the value of foveated map weight. Then we calculate the foveated importance for each VPL based on the formatted weight of the voxels available from the VPL. We perform a VPL management to select the optimized set of VPLs with the largest formatted importance to render high quality indirect illumination in formal region. And we name them essential VPLs. In this process, the interpol are essential VPLs of the previous frame and the VPL candidate of the current frame. And the output are essential VPLs of the current frame. Yellow point represents the essential VPLs of the frame I minus one. In the frame I, the four-way origin and the aircraft's position change. First, we need to update the position and the normal direction of the essential VPLs of previous frame based on frame I. The green point indicates the updated VPLs on the aircraft of frame I. If the position or normal direction 
of the VPL changes significantly. The VPL will be discarded. Then we recontinued the formulated importance of the updated essential VPLs of the previous frame according to the current formula regime and the same. The updated essential VPLs of frame I minus one together with the VPL candidates generated in step two as a red point are used to selecting the essential VPLs of the frame I according to the full weighted importance and the density control. After the selection, the yellow point visualizes the new essential VPLs for frame I. The last step renders the scenes with the essential VPLs. We update the availability of the essential VPLs of top 5% for weighted importance with polaroid shadow mapping. We adjust the deferred shading and the inter interleaved sampling method to rendering the indirect illumination with the essential VPLs efficiently. Finally, we combine the indirect and the direct illumination to get the final global illumination result. We compare our result with part tracing and external reality. The color blink effect of our method is closer to Patrici than that of instant reality. In the yard scene, instant reality shows brighter orange on the barrier than the Patrici and our result. In the balcony scene, instant reality is the orange color bleeding on the ground. Compared with instant reality, our method achieves smaller MSE values in the foveal region. The MSE values in the foveal region of our method are consistently smaller than those in the peripheral region. This figure visualizes time spent on each step for the sponsor scene using our method and instant reality. Since our VPL management scheme, our method can save 80% of the time cost for generating shadow maps. This table shows the frame running time of our method and the speed up versus the instant reality compared with the instant reality with 1000 VPLs. Our method already achieves an acceleration of three to four times by using more VPLs. Our echo achieves similar MIT values in the foveal region to our method. Compared to our echo, our method achieves a speed up of 10 to 13 times. We have percent correlated uh, instant reality method to for running high quality elimination effect in the foveal region based on optimizing the distribution of VPLs over frames. Our method produces most elimination effect surprises the temporal artifact caused by sudden change of VPLs and achieves a better temporal stability than the instant reduction method. Our method also supports a variety of dynamic scenes thanks to our VPL resuming scheme. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Uh, if you want to give a clap or clapping, you can press F4 and then you can clap like this. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I don't see any questions so far in the Hoover. Uh, to, to, Lily, uh, to, to just to be clear, the VPL stands for virtual point lights, correct? Yes. VPL indicates the virtual point lights. Okay. Okay. So, you know, they basically 
paper is about to reduce the number of VPLs by using for the edit to bring it, you know, it just two simple buttons. So, okay, so I then I will have a question. So if I understand it correctly, so you are assuming basically uh, rather continuous frames to keep the temporal coherence. So, but I think eyes usually move from point to point. So my question is, can you can your method still offer high quality results under this kind of fast eye movement? Or do you see some additional artifacts or isn't it matter because the next frame will be rendered as a totally different view from the the view in the previous frame. Um, actually, our method is based on the um, reuse of VPLs. So in the next frame, we actually use a big part of last, uh, last of frames VPLs. Uh, the temporal stability is based on this. So the the sound quality was a little bit poor, but yeah, I think I could get that. Okay, so audience yet? So maybe I can have my second question. So regarding the speed of processing, in which pixel resolutions do you have in the current current performance test? Is is your method scalable in terms of the resolution, or it's just you linearly increase the speed uh, or re reduce the speed depending on the resolution? Um, uh, Hello. Oh, yeah. I, I can understand your questions clearly. Sorry. Ah, okay, so let me rephrase that. So I want to ask about the speed of your method. So which pixel resolution do you use in your performance test? Did you use in your performance test? Was it like a full HD or 4K or was it like a VGA resolution? I hope my sound is clear. Oh, I'm so sorry, sorry. Okay, so maybe we can discuss this later. So any So any any questions from the audience? I mean yeah, you can freely post in public chat, or otherwise you can just go to the Hoover. If not, maybe I think we can go to the next uh, presentation. Thank you for presentation. The next presentation is about NeatNet, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, NeatNet adapting surface normal knowledge for intrinsic image decomposition in indoor scenes, presented by uh, Yundan Duo. Please go ahead. This is Jun Dan Luo. I'm glad to present NeatNet adapting surface normal knowledge for intrinsic image decomposition in indoor scenes. This work was done when I was at Zhejiang University and the same time joint lab of 3D video with Zhao Yang Huang, Yi Jing Li, Xiao Wei Zhou, Guo Feng Zhang, and Hu Jun Bao. In tracing image decomposition, which is simply called IID, means to estimate multiple physical characteristics from natural photos. Typically, Researchers aim at estimating a reflectance image and a shading image from a single input. In the IID task, shading estimation is to recover real lighting effects of the scene. So estimated shading is commonly used for photorealistic image editing, which can be applied in augmented reality applications. 
The decomposition equation is shown here. Many works, including ours, have focused on inversion scenes. Under this assumption, the input image can be simply reconstructed by a channel-wise multiplication of its reflectance and shading. However, the decomposition equation is under constraint. To release ambiguities in the decomposition process, extra priors or information are required. In recent years, promising progress of IID has been achieved by automatically learning priors from training data. But at present, there are no methods or devices to annotate dense intrinsic image labels in real things. Lack of training data is another problem hindering the development of IID. In order to release the two problems I mentioned above, we propose NeatNet. This is a learning-based framework that improves IID by making use of available surface normal datasets. Inspired by previous works, we take surface normal as our extra information. Moreover, we propose two novel ways to integrate learned surface normal knowledge into IID. So this is an overview of our proposed need net. We focus on shading estimation. The so omit the reflectance branch here. The need net consists of a normal estimation module and an IID net. It takes a single image as input, predicts a surface normal map via the normal estimation module, and predicts intrinsic images via the IID net. What is special is that the branch of shading estimation integrates surface normal knowledge. The fundamental component of the need net is the normal estimation module. It is singled out and trained to capture geometry features and predict surface normals. After pre-training the normal estimation module, we design an encoder-to-encoder -encoder block to share geometry features. This block is called normal feature adapter. We use three adapters to propagate the same geometry features to the IID net, so that the IID net can focus on learning complicated lighting conditions with the support of geometry priors. The normal feature adapter is designed like this. It extracts and encodes useful features by an up projection block. And then it uses concatenate and convolutional layers to fuse features. Besides feature sharing, surface normal information is further incorporated via rendering. The main challenge in shading reconstruction is how to model the spatially varying lighting conditions in indoor environments. In our work, we propose to represent it by pixel-wise integrated lighting. The integrated lighting is derived from the Nambertian rendering equation. In Nambertian things, shading is the summation of the contribution by each incident light. The shading caused by each light is the dot product of the surface normal and the lighting vector. We will write this rendering equation in this form. The final shading of the illuminated point can be reconstructed by a vector that encodes its nearby lighting environment. The vector A is the integrate of lighting, so we call it integrated lighting. In order to represent spatially varying lighting indoors, we propose to predict a map of pixel-wise integrated lighting vectors. In our work, shading is reconstructed by predicted surface normals and predicted integrated lighting. Compared with pixel-wise spherical harmonics lighting models proposed by Joe, Pixel-wise integrated lighting vectors are lightweight and easier to train. The memory of NeatNet learns knowledge from the available surface normal datasets and adapts its knowledge for IID via normal feature adapters and rendering. Normal estimation is trained on the real-world datasets, while shading estimation is trained on the synthetic CGI dataset. The network details and the last functions are presented in our paper.
As for experiments, we evaluate our method both quantitatively and qualitatively. Here, we show some quantitative results on the real-world test bed. As for reflectors, a smaller number is better, and our lead net achieves the fourth best result among all these methods. But if compared with the models only trained on the synthetic data sets, that is the CGI and the Sun CG, our lead net achieves the best. As for shading, a higher number is better and our need net achieves the best performance in shading estimation among all these methods. Note that the IID net part of our framework does not require training on the real-world datasets, but it can achieve the best performance in shading on the real-world datasets via incorporating knowledge from surface normal. We also conduct video comparisons. We compare our shading image with the least result and the truth result. This model directly predicts shading from a single input image, while Joe's model first predicts pixel-wise spherical harmonics lighting models, and then reconstructs shading. We and Joe both want to take surface normal and extra information, but we make use of it in different ways. Here, blue rectangles show that our shading results have the least texture residuals. Orange rectangles show that our method recovers the sharpest highlights and the sharpest geometry contours. Besides, this shading image is of low contrast. Also, we usually compare these methods by surface recovery application. We recolor some surfaces in a real scene. For each method, the new surfaces are rendered by multiplying the target reflectance with its estimated shading. The red arrows show that our method recovers the darkest shadows on the floor, the bed, and the wall. Besides, as shown by the blue rectangle, our method has less erroneous texture residuals in the shading image. In Galoche's result, some residual textures are shifted into the estimated shading. We believe that shading estimated by our method is of the best quality. We show that if we use shading learned by our network, we can also conduct editing of illumination varying image sequences. We show two of them here. Each sequence will be displayed twice, once at a faster speed and another time at a lower speed. The left image is the original image, and the right image is edited with estimated shading. For more information, you can reach me through the email shown here, and the source code for our method is available online. Thank you very much. A nice talk. Uh, done. And so let's have a, let's move on to the QA session. So, so far, I don't see any questions, unfortunately, from the audience. Then maybe I can start from their short question. So, so it's a simple question, but uh, does your system run in real time? Mm. Um, do you mean the demo uh, we shown at the last? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, no. Um... Um, I, I think um, um, I think I must um, explain to you um, multiple aspects. Uh, the first is um, the network, the average inference time for the network achieves about uh, 14, uh, 14 FPS. 
Um, but actually, we think as the lighting conditions are not changing uh, very fast. So for uh, air application, we may it's not necessary for us to um, predict shading for each frame. Uh, for example, we can predict the shading at the start of the AR game or just um, predict the shading of each keyframe. So um, at present, the, the network cannot achieve uh, real-time performance, but we can do some other things. Uh, um, actually, it's not very necessary, I think. And, and for the editing, uh, the editing is real-time because if we estimate the shading, or, uh, the final composed image is just a three-channel multiplication, that is. Okay, I see. Thanks. So, okay, so I can, I will have the second question. So the, I think the video results in this slide seem to show that uh, you are adding synthetic images on walls or some flat regions in the scene only. So do you have any reasons for this? Mm, uh, sorry, I don't uh, listen clearly. Um, so uh, let mean... me so repeat that. Uh, I think in the video, you showed the AR result or the composition of a uh, result of the composition of the synthetic image, like the logo of Isma and the wall. But I think it was only happening on the walls or some flat areas. So is there any reasons for this? Can you overlay something on a complex model? Or complex, uh, how can I say, three D complex area in the scene. Uh, okay, um, um, so uh, I think uh, there are not always planar regions. Um, in our in our paper, also in the slide, I have shown um, uh, surface recoloring application. Um, it's uh, large areas, uh, not just uh, planar regions. And uh, we should plan a region because we think it's more suitable for some AR applications such as uh, scene decoration and uh, uh, virtual poster insertions. Uh, not just um, not because it can only be used for plan regions, just for the application. Okay, I see. So, still no questions from the audience. So, okay, so I can have one more question. So I think you are giving geometry features extracted from a decoder in the normal map network and then giving output normal map to the neat net. So how did you figure out this approach works better than the others? I mean, you know, you have two inputs to the neat net, if I understand it correctly. So why can't you just add the normal map that comes from the first network and then just plug it in in, in the end of the uh, the neat net? Mm, so so what think, was the, the the idea behind this? Uh, so I think your question is why did we choose uh, service normal? Is, no, no. Uh, is, why? Why do you have two inputs for NetNet from the normal map generator? I mean, decoder and encoder. Uh, um, um, so the question is, why do, I, do we use two encoders, right? Kind of. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, the reason is that the the these two subnetworks are trained on two different data sets. And the normal estimation module is trained on the uh, real world data set, and the ID part is trained on the synthetic data set. And our main idea is to make use of available real world data sets. And uh, as the, but for real world data sets, there are no labels for interest, no dense labels for intrinsic image decomposition. So in order to capture the knowledge from surface normal more effectively, we use this structure with the two encoders and the two decoders. And um, it's two it's a two stage training. The first stage is to train surface normal on real world data sets. And another stage is to train 
ID on synthetic data sets. So we are short in time, so let's thanks to the uh, presenter again. And let's move on to the next one. Sorry, I, I forgot to introduce the, for the last uh, presentation. The title is Flower Factory, a component based approach for rapid flower modeling presented by Hu Yang Wang. Hello everyone. My name is Jung Suen Bai from Biang University. The title of our paper is Flower Factory, a component-based approach for rapid flower modeling. This work is cooperated with Si Yuan Wang, Jun Jun Pan, and Jing Glei Wang. I will introduce our work in four aspects. Flowers are frequently utilized in CG applications, such as video games film production, and VRAR scenes. However, due to the complex structure of the flower, it is quite tactical and time-consuming for designers to generate a realistic flower using the 3D modeling software. In traditional modeling pipeline, designers must create the shape and produce the textures for each component. It usually takes more than 20 minutes to generate a 3D flower. Although some works have investigated the reconstruction from X-ray, images, or point clouds, they require users to provide complex structural information, and they are time-consuming. The challenges we face are from three aspects. First, how to create realistic flowers. Second, how to reduce the computational cost or complicated interactions. Third, is it possible to be integrated in lightweight applications? In this paper, we propose a component-based approach for rapid flower modeling. Our contributions are listed as follows. First, our comprehensive component-based framework can be controlled by a set of parameters. It greatly reduces the computational cost and ensures the framework can be integrated into mobile platform. Second, the components can be assembled in different ways to create various types of flowers. Also, we present straightforward strategies to handle the collisions of petals. Third, we design a number of rules and provide a predefined mask to adjust the color distribution on the petal surface. Now, let me introduce the method details. This is the framework of our method. After the user sets the parameters, the flower is created from two perspectives. One is the geometry, the other is the texture. The floral components consist of petals, leaves, receptacles and stamens. Petals and leaves are created using two boundary curves on 2D planes. The region for the boundary curves is defined, and the control points must locate in this region. We generate smooth boundary curves using B-spline, which is defined by the control points. After the boundary is constructed, the petal is subdivided and triangulated. Serrate leaves often appear in nature. So, we add sawtooth to the boundaries of leaves. In practice, a set of patterns are predefined. Since the models are created on 2D plane, we employ linear blend skinning to produce the 3D geometry. We compute the Euclidean distances from the points on the surface to the points on the central vein. Then we use the distances to compute the rigging weights. After that, to change the shape, we make the central vein to fit a 3D curve. A complete flower can be constructed after each component is created. A set of parameters can be specified, such as the number of leaves, the height of the interval, and the rotate angle alpha. The stamens are created based on a spiral curve. The cell index increases along the curve. Then the stamens are located on the cells. Also. To handle the collisions and overlaps between different layers, a small interval is added. In the same layer, an interval is also added between adjacent petals. The opening state is controlled by an input angle beta. The blooming animation is generated using linear interpolation of the corresponding points, which are the closed flower and the opening flower. 
To create the textures, we define a set of rules. We define a mask for the petal to create the streaks. We use a heuristic method to simulate the diffusion of the pigments. In general, the colors at the edge and the root are different from the center. Therefore, we set some parameters to control the color density. The technical details can be found in the paper. The texture generation for the leaves is similar to the petals. However, the leaves usually have regular veins. We specify the pattern of leaf veins, and users can set the number of branches and the width of veins. Next, the experimental results. This video shows the variations of the petals with different shapes. These shapes are controlled by parameters. This video shows the variations of different number of layers and different number of petals. This video shows different flowers created by our method. Also, we test scenes with blossom clusters. We compare our work with other method. This comparison is for the blooming animation. Zheng's method need 11 minutes to create the entire animation, but our method only need 4 seconds. We also invited 3D designers to create similar flowers using their familiar tools. Our method need much less time than the designer. Finally, we conduct a user study to evaluate the effectiveness of our system. The evaluators think our method is easy to use and the parameters are rational, but the fidelity is relatively low. Also, intra-class correlation coefficient, ICC, is employed to evaluate the consistency of the questionnaire. The ICC is 0.932, is much higher than 0.75. It means that the consistency is very high. Our system is not without limitations. First, our approach cannot generate inflorescence. Second, our system does not employ any biological knowledge for the modeling. Third, our system cannot produce flowers directly from photos. Conclusion in future work In this paper, we propose a component-based framework for rapid modeling of flowers. Our technique is capable of producing a variety of flowers quickly. In the future, we plan to develop an image-based interface for the modeling. Also, biologically-based rules may enhance the geometry and texture generation. Moreover, we consider to add more functions into our system such as inflorescence. The followings are the fundings. That's all. Thank you. Any questions can be sent to the authors. For an interesting uh, presentation. So let's move on to the uh, QA. So, so far, I don't see any questions from the audience again. So, we have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So I I think I think your system is is designed to cover the bud to the uh, full bloom in the animation. And but I as a as a Japanese, I think that in, uh, I think that including the process of drying and blasting flowers as an expression would be an interesting direction. Like for example, uh, cherry blossoms falling by the window uh, wind blow. For example, have you ever thought of that direction? Uh, yes, the flower modeling is very interesting. Uh, especially, it's very. Uh, for the complex structures, and uh, I think the in in, ja in Japan there may be some uh, very interesting applications for the uh, interactive modeling. Yes. Okay. So, uh, do you have any thoughts about you know uh, drying flowers or dying flowers, which will be you know blasted by the wind or something? You know, probably be I'm going to say so as an expression. 
a drawing of a flower or a draw a you mean a a draw a flower and uh, generate the three D model, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that's a uh, yes. That's very uh, uh, it's uh, it's in our plan in the future. Uh, but right now we are focusing on the uh, on a rapid modeling uh, using this uh, this uh, perce uh, uh, para uh, para uh, parametric uh, method. Uh, yes, I think it's very uh, useful if we can uh, integrate uh, a drawing method, a drawing interface in our system. Thanks. Um, okay, I think I found a question. A question from Yu Peng. Uh, what's the challenge of lava modeling? Uh, and what else can be studied in the future based uh, future based on your work? Uh, OK, uh, so yes, as, as mentioned uh, before, uh, we think uh, the structure is very, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, so we use, uh, we use a component based approach to model the flower. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, uh, draw a flower and uh, generate the 3D model is a uh, promising. And we think if we can take a picture and uh, uh, the, the modeling, uh, uh, if you can create a 3D model from an uh, image, that's very uh, useful too, yes. So you mean like an image modeling? Yeah, it's maybe like from the images. Uh, yes, from image uh, image or from uh, multiple images uh, or uh, or oh, okay. a sketch. Mm -hmm. Yes, a sketch. So I found the next question uh, from Hiromu. Uh, can the proposed method be integrated into existing three D modeling software? Uh, not yet. Uh, we have uh, not uh, integrated this 3D modeling uh, into a uh, uh, software. Uh, uh, we, uh, yeah, but our method, we think our method is uh, uh, is very easy to implement. Yes. So I think I have another question. Okay, so I have a question from Vinu Kamala Sanan. Sorry for my pronunciation, but uh, the, the question is how can the rules applied for geometry of leaves be extended to biological rules of your future work? Uh, you mean the biological uh, knowledge? Yes, uh, uh, we think the, the textures of the leaves, uh, that's uh, maybe we can learn something from the biological books. Uh, yes, the pigments of the of the leaves and the flowers or the petals, uh, that may be, uh, we can model the textures from, uh, from uh, some biological knowledge. So this would be the last question, I think, uh, from Tobias Chuvans. Uh, is it possible to generate a group of flowers which are similar but different? And uh, would this increase the gener uh, generation speed? Uh, in in this video, we show uh, we show uh, a flower uh, cluster. Uh, actually, we create the flowers uh, one by one. So uh, it maybe maybe takes a, a little of a. Uh, 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 some time to create uh, create uh, uh, create the flower, but uh, since our system is parametric, so we can copy the parameters and uh, generate the, it very quickly. We can change uh, a little uh, parameters. So, but but the but the uh, generation are different. Generation results are different. Okay. So this is the end of the. This session, right? Okay, yes, nothing.